Um, so I want to begin with this epigraph with one of my favorite thinkers, uh, feminist theorist Astrida Neimanis. She writes that water connects the human scale to other scales of life, both unfathomable and imperceptible. We are all bodies of water in the constitutional, the genealogical, and the geographical sense. So recent scholarship in the environmental humanities has taken an oceanic turn. Caribbean cultural imaginaries have always been extensively engaged with an oceanic imaginary as a space of origins as well as a space of destiny. As we know from Nobel Prize winning St. Lucian poet Derek Walcott, the sea is history, monument, vault, and force of erasure. My paper turns to the questions of representability of embodied fluidity and flow, particularly in the work of Caribbean artists Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, born in Cuba and now working in the US, and Deborah Jack, born in St. Martin. Um, actually, she's born here in the Netherlands, raised in St. Martin, uh, and now works in the US. I place their visual allegories of oceanic embodiment in a conversation with scholarship arguing for an ontological turn to wet matter. And that's a term that I'm borrowing from Phil Steinberg and uh, Kimberly Davis. At a critical moment of sea level rise in this earth crisis, some are calling the Anthropocene. This paper is a part of a larger project to understand how Cold War logics and legacies, and as we can see, ongoing legacies, render the planetary ocean as a, quote, inner space counter to an extraterritorial outer space. And these are the terms used by the US military in particular. This is a legacy of underwater habitats built by the US military in the Caribbean and elsewhere, as well as the ways in which the underwater world became accessible through visual media by figures such as Jacques Cousteau. These Cold War logics and sciences led to our carbon data for measuring climate change and the Anthropocene, and set the scene for our narratives of apocalypse, both understood in terms of nuclear war as well as climate change. My larger project is to rethink the ways in which these geopolitical claims to so-called inner space and outer space are complicated, localized, refigured, and embodied. I hope it won't be too dizzying, but I'll be trying to work through this at the intersectional scales of the ontological, the cultural, the historical, and the ecological. Telescoping between the scales of climate change and weather, and between outer and inner space, my paper explores the ways in which these artists render allegories of the Anthropocene, as well as embodied sea ontologies emerging in the wake, as Christina Sharp would remind us, of Black Atlantic and other crossings. So let's dive in. In recent years, an oceanic imaginary is apparent in scholarship and art that is responding to the threat of sea level rise, adding a new dimension to how we might theorize our relationship to the larger space on Earth, our planet ocean. For most continental dwellers, the ocean has been imagined as external and even alien until, with the increase in extreme weather events, it floods your home, something well known to the people of Amsterdam, of Venice, of Tuvalu, and many other places. With glacial melt and oceanic thermal expansion, our planetary future is becoming more oceanic. Sea level rise may be one of our greatest visible signs of planetary change, connecting the activity of the Earth's poles with the rest of the terrestrial world, producing a new sense of planetary scale, and perhaps even a sense of interconnectedness through the rising of a world ocean. So while the Anthropocene locates humans as geological agents, one might also trace out a discourse of oceanic agency that makes the constructed and false binaries or boundaries between the human and nature all the more porous and fluid. For decades, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons has represented the complexity, the depth, volume, and embodiment of the oceanic realm. Her work poses an important visualization of the ways in which critical ocean studies scholars have called to move beyond the surface of the ocean where human, mostly male agents, cross to provide a deeper, more submarine engagement with wet matter, non-human creatures, and animacies, and sea ontologies. Oceanographers and scholars from Jacques Cousteau and Sylvia Earle to Stacey Alimo, Stefan Helmreich, and myself have observed the ways in which our briny blood represents an inner ocean, 
reflecting our evolutionary origins as well as our anticipated destiny in terms of climate change. These are complex multiscalar engagements with the human body as a body of water and the oceanic body as a human ancestor. But I want to complicate and nuance this narrative by turning to Caribbean contexts of plumbing the Atlantic to recuperate what Kamal Brathwaite would term submerged mothers, which are of the African past, present, and an Anthropocene future. Since, since the 1990s, Campos Pons' large-scale Polaroid work has returned to a series of interrelated panels that map a grid of watercolors representing a bright submarine blue that always incorporates some human or humanoid form. The artist's representations of the oceanic are compelling, intimate, and appealing. Her oceanic imaginary is often peopled, accessible, and while not realist, certainly suggests the volume and multidimensionality of the sea. To Campos Pons, the oceanic is not the pure realm of quote unquote nature, as the binaries of Western thought might suggest, nor is it a foe to be conquered. Her oceanic imaginary, rendered as medium and as matter in watercolors, renders a wet ontology or a sense of being created by and in water, most powerfully through color itself. Thus, we might understand her work is embodying what the anthropologist Michael Tausig has called, quote unquote, a color vision that is world centered, where color is not secondary to form, but is rather an animating, life giving force that is critical to the experience of the work. Yet, this color consciousness and sense is particularly gendered, cultured, and embodied. The color blue in Campos Pons's photographic installations is associated with the Orisha or spirit Yamaya. A Yoruba transplant to the Americas, Yamaya is the mother of the Orishas and an ocean spirit of maternal generosity associated with the crescent moon, the color blue, and the protector of fishermen. Yamaya, Our Lady of Regla, procession in Cuba, she's also manifested as the Virgin Mary, the patron saint of Havana Harbor. While Yamaya provides the critical form and color to the majority of Campos Pons's work, it is perhaps most visible in her panel from the series, When I Am Not Here, Estoy Allá. This represents a photograph of the artist's upper torso, painted in multiple hues of blue and of purple, punctuated by white painted crescent waves. In her hand, she holds towards the viewer an unvarnished wooden carved vessel, which presumably catches the milk hanging from two baby bottles that are worn around the neck and lay flat, partially filled over the breasts. The image is striking for the color contrast between the oceanic body and the lightness of the milk and vessel, as well as the prosthetic mammaries invoking the maternal generosity of Yamaya and her offerings. It also suggests her exploitation, since the bottles are weighted heavily by a plastic cord around the headless figure's neck. In a statement, the artist has written of her attempt to represent, quote, the spaces that are constructed between dualities, end quote. And in this sense, the dualities here are thematic. The exploitation of black women's bodies in the plantation Americas as well as perhaps our own participation in this as spectators, as we too drink from the aesthetic and the spiritual milk of Yamaya. This vessel, we might say, is her craft. Like other Caribbean artists, she creates a visual pun on la mer, or mar madre, as well as what Kamal Brathwaite has written of in terms of the submerged mothers of African diasporic history that he writes must be reawakened and recuperated. Although this point is over, often overlooked, these mothers are quite critical to his theory of tidalectics. So I want to borrow from a piece that Tatiana Flores and I co-wrote together called Submerged Bodies about the suboceanic or tidalectic imaginary in Caribbean visual arts. That particular collaboration has fundamentally informed my thinking in this particular paper. In that earlier piece, we demonstrated how the French feminist theory of Luce Eragaray on the female body and fluidity foregrounded the gestational materialities of metaphor. 
particularly the play and some Francophone Caribbean words, works between the terms mare and mother or mare and sea. Some of those artists were responding to French philosopher Gaston Bachelard, who quotes a colleague that imagined, quote, nature is an immense eternal mother projected into infinity, end quote. More recently, Nemanas has recuperated French feminist thought to engage what she calls the amniotic logics of the metaphor of the maternal sea. While the scholarship has too easily been dismissed as essentialist in reducing women to biology, Nemanas raises the important question, are we not all bodies of water? She suggests the idea that the aqueous body is gender neutral, quote, might invite all bodies to attend to the water that facilitates their existence. End quote. In that sense, water is collective memory and also archive at a global scale. Whereas Christina Sharp has demonstrated that water is also material memory and that the bodies overthrown, um, thrown, sorry, thrown overboard in the Middle Passage continue to cycle through the trophic systems of the ocean's ecology. As Naimanis observes, and I'll quote once again, water extends embodiment in time, body to body to body. Water, in the sense, is facilitative and directed towards the becoming of other bodies, end quote. So while this feminist work has offered a critical lens to think through the oceanic and the body, it has tended to work at universal scales in non-racialized contexts. In contrast, Campos Pons is contributing to a long conversation in the Caribbean about the oceanic imaginary in which the sea represents simultaneous origins and the future, a sacred space of the Orishas and ancestors, the fluidity of identity, the maternal body, the terrors of the Middle Passage, and the more recent refugee experiences of balseros and boat people. To Trinidadian scholar Carol Boyce Davies, the Caribbean Sea is a site of continuous change and the ongoing questions of self, origin, and direction. To Brathwaite, Caribbean unity is submarine, a fluid regional imaginary that Martinique and Enfer Edouard Glissant has often reiterated. To him, the Caribbean is not insular, but rather is defined through rhizomatic submarine routes floating free, not in one fi uh, fixed in one position in some primordial spot, but extending in all directions in our world through its networks and branches. This worldly, if not cosmic, viewpoint has been echoed by Cuban author Antonio Benitez Zorjo, who imagines the region of consisting of the peoples of the sea who are traveling together towards the infinite. In this sense of grasping towards the infinite is represented in Campos Pons' repeated connections between the ocean, understood as an inner space, and the constellations, which is to say outer space. This is evident in works that we've seen earlier, such as uh, Elevata, as well as works uh, that she's titled called Constellation, and she always knew of the space in between. This interrelationship between the cosmic and the oceanic realms is represented figuratively, as well as in the deep shadings of the color blue and purple that bring them together in a profoundly transformative color sense, to echo back to Tausig. So in an interview, Campos Pons has suggested that while her oceanic imaginary speaks to the material histories of diasporic um, subjects to the Caribbean, including her Chinese and European ancestors, her work is equally engaged in exploring what she calls psychological space. This representation of an oceanic inner space is rendered by floating liquid dreamscapes that emanate from the artist's suspended head and hair, as we've seen in Elevata, and are evoked in the very titles of her works, such as Luminous Being, Floating Between Temperature Zones, and Blue Refugee. For instance, in Nesting 4, a photograph of the art artist's head is divided vertically into two panels, separated by two additional panels of blue watercolor. As with most, if not all, of her work, the panels are separated by white bars or frames, while horizontal breaststrokes or hair extensions move across the borders, stitching them together. The two panels of nesting four that occupy the interstitial headspace suggest the figure's inner consciousness, 
This is represented by the baby blue color on the left inner panel and the more steel colored blue on the right. The hair extensions that crosses them, the hair extension that crosses them could be a bar of energy or electricity, suggested by the antenna-like beaded and feathered point emerging from the left side of the figure's scalp. As with most of the artist's self-representations, her eyes are closed in a gesture of meditation, thought, or perhaps communication with and through this blue inner space, this blue ocean being. There are two readings I want to present here of what Tausig in another context calls the bodily unconscious generated by the color blue and what scholar Babatunde Lawal uh, refers to in Yoruba context is one's spiritual or inner head. In Yoruba cosmology, the pottery creator Obatala modeled the first human being out of clay, which came to life with the divine breath of Oludumare. Subsequently, all humans are gifted with a physical head that represents the materiality of the body, but must choose an inner head that represents their destiny. It is the inner head that mediates between the individual and the Orisha. Elaborate artistic hairdressing is the practice to venerate one's inner or spiritual head. As Lisa Friedman has suggested, this helps us understand the repetition of the disembodied head in Campos Pons's work and the possibility that the long hair extensions that reach across boundaries emanate from the head of the artist slash figure slash yamaya as a line or wavelength of communication, energy, and creativity. Thus the ocean surrounds and submerges a human form in the installation, just as we as viewers are often positioned below in a submarine dreamscape. That dreamscape is expansive rather than a two-dimensional one due to the way in which the artist represents depth and volume by staging them first as sculptures, then photographing the watercolors of layered shades of blue as well as waves and whirls of blue paint as we saw in Elevata. So while these are meditative and often serene submarine scapes, they represent the photographic capturing of a moment in stillness amidst subtle movement and change. In that sense, we as viewers are invited to participate in that subtle meditation on blue ocean being, on bodies of water and watery embodiment. The bodily unconscious represented here, the seascape of the inner head or space is perhaps what could be called an oceanic feeling. So you'll have to forgive me now as I resuscitate Freud, only to say that his interpretation of this as, a re as regressive completely misdirects us from what Romain Rallard, through mystic Hinduism, was referring to as a maternal superconsciousness, a state of being outside of time itself. Read through this work, we should more properly locate the oceanic feeling as a state of becoming in an ocean of being. Through her invocation of the blues of Yamaya, Campos Pons allows us to participate in the process. This is a blue ocean of being and becoming that can be witnessed because these are not the dark, inaccessible depths of the ocean, but rather bright blue waters permeated by light. They invite one to dive in, to merge, and to experience an ocean of spirit. The color blue in the sky as well as the seas is the manifestation of how the white light of the sun is diffracted. The long wavelengths of red and yellow are absorbed by water or particles leading to the short wavelengths of blue to render light visible in and of itself. In that sense, both air and water can be understood as mediums rather than spaces. But light itself cannot be seen. It is only illuminated by color and objects. Thus, Campos Pons' preferred media, watercolor or glass, capture light's blue illumination and thus enable our participation in this vision of becoming. It's this tension between absence and presence, the seen and unseen, that underlies so much of Campos Pons' visual vocabulary. In an interview, she has mentioned the vital influence of scholar Homi Baba's concepts of interstitial space, the space between, which is evident in the very title of her series, When I Am Not Here, Estoy Allá. Estoy Allá can be translated as I am there, but it could also mean out there in the beyond. This tension between absence and presence is a through line in Campos Pons' work, read materially in terms of diasporic identity and in the linguistic tension between the title um, in English and Spanish. Yet it could also be considered in ontological and psychological terms as a process of becoming. 
This is evident in her more recent work, She Always Knew of the Space in Between from 2019, which she uses gouache method that thickens the watercolors, giving them a sense of tactility. She produces work using a peacock feather associated with the iridescent blues of Yamaya, deepening her usual palette of blues to incorporate more violet. This five-part panel, and here I have represented just the center three panels, um, is focalized by two figures in the center, possibly adopted from Dogon's sculpture, who face each other, perhaps embodying the critical space in between. The right figure is larger than the left, but they are lacking the sex characteristics, sex characteristics, particularly breasts, that would definitively gender one or the other. Both have large, rounded shoulders, oblong torsos, triangular buttocks, and elongated, almost extraterrestrial-looking heads. The alien cosmological theme is repeated throughout the panels, including painted lines of blue and violet that cross the figures and repeat the patterns of concentric circles, as well as exploding or expanding energy, like the Big Bang or the destruction of a star. The theme of the space between is both interpersonal, evident in the figures, as well as cosmological. The panels, read left to right, seem to move from the cosmological origins um, to the figure of the generating mother in the second panel. And if you look on the bottom right in the yellow, that's the figure of her mother. Her mother, whose luminous yellow, green, and blue figuration generates a series of blue and violet circles, as you can see them moving above her. These in turn give rise to a cardinal, perhaps even vaginal mapping, north, south, east, and west above her, reiterating a long-held theme in Campos Pons's work of what poet Norbese Philip describes of as displace. Creative works ranging from Chastity Belt back in 1984 and Conception in 87, Campos Pons has frequently invoked what Judy Chicago and other feminist artists have turned vaginal iconography. In fact, resisting the label of abstract artist, Campos Pons has argued, playfully I imagine, that her work is, quote, simply a magnified representation of our sexual or organs, end quote. To Philip, writing of women on, of African descent in the post-plantation Americas, public space must be read and interpreted from the point of view of the safety of the space between the legs. And let me quote her at length. In patriarchal societies, the female body has always has, represents a subversive threat. By far the most efficient management tool of women is the possibility of the uninvited, uninvited and forceful invasion of the space between the legs, rape, which is constant. A threat to the space, the inner space between the legs. Even if never carried out, this threat continually and persistently inflects how the female reads the external language of place or public space, the outer space. One woman raped is sufficient to vocalize and reify the threat of outer space, and the need to protect this inner space means that the female always reads the outer space from the dichotomous position, safe, unsafe, prohibited, unprohibited. So here the false dichotomy of inner versus outer space is dismantled and gendered in relationship to the legacies of colonial racialized violence against black women. Philip asks, and I quote, what is the language of the inner space, end quote. Campos Pons seems to provide us with multiple creative and complex answers. Certainly it is not linear, nor can it be easily located in Western models of time and space. It is oceanic, fluid, and in progress. It seems to be more of a medium of transportation than a space. It is both the stillness of contemplation and generative becoming. It is maternal and generative, but perhaps conflicted about the relentless cycles of giving. It includes and even welcomes an audience in the process of initiation and transformation. It is blue ocean being and becoming. These questions of representing watery bodies and bodies of water in the Anthropocene are equally critical to the photographic and video installation of Deborah Jack, whose visual iconography provides a multi-scalar lens for thinking through watery embodiment. There's, simulta there's a simultaneity to time evident in the work of Campos Pons in the way in which Yamaya is continually embodied as African past, Cuban or diasporic present, and an oceanic future. While both artists favor large visual installations, perhaps speaking to the tremendous scale of the oceanic, Jack's oceanic imaginary foregrounds a brooding grayscale and agential ocean. 
Eschewing the tropical blues of the tourist industry, Jack strips the color and fragments the images to, cr to create an uncanny ocean space. In fact, much of this footage that you'll see here was shot in the Netherlands. In the video series Drawn by Water, the ocean finds voice, but it's not the expected rhythms we hear with the human ears. In a series of films that focus on waves crashing on the shore that do not prioritize human figuration, the human body is not the metaphor for the ocean, but rather the ocean becomes the metaphor for bodies. This is the inverse figuration to what we see in Encampo's poems, which is how human bodies embody and scale up to the immensity and sacredness of the oceanic. Drawn by water, sea drawings in three acts, stages a visual narrative of the oceanic, beginning with weight, W-A-I-T, and weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, on the water, calling attention to the temporality of fluidity, as well as literal and symbolic volume of the ocean. In this piece, our vision becomes diffracted into rectangular segment, segments that interrupt the assumed ebb and flow of tidal ectics. To wait, W-A-I-T, on the water, is also to have an apprehension, perhaps of the way in which this body will rise to take other bodies. As the artist notes, does water have memory? What is the tension when the water and the land connect, when different bodies of water connect and when bodies and water connect? How is this drawn on the water? What are the shared vulnerabilities of colonizer and the colonized when rising sea levels threaten the existence of both? Certainly in all of her work, which is turned repeatedly to the oceanic, to salt, and to sites of memory, we can see that the return to sites of trauma is to recognize that in the artist's words, there are also sites of healing. These spaces live together. You have to return because there is a spirit." End quote. In her invocation of oceanic bodies, the artist has been inspired by Toni Morrison's theory of re-memory, where, to quote Jack, memory is a sort of energy that travels right through time and space. Water has memory. So when there's a flood, it's not that the area gets flooded, it's that the water remembers where it used to go, end quote. This memory of water in and outside of human history is critical to understanding the way in which Jack represents the hurricanes that are simultaneously the mark of anthropogenic climate change as well as the re-memory of unburied souls who have perished in the crossing of both the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic. Pointing out that the hurricane derives its liquid fuel from salt water, which in turn rains down on the region, Jack provides a complex figuration of time and of the bodies that circulate through the deep side time of the hydrological cycle. You'll notice that we have a juxtaposition of the shore level view of the oceanic on the left, um, and its creation of a contact zone at the beach, a space of transition and change, as well as, in the center, a satellite view of the hurricane system, hundreds of miles wide. I'd like to suggest that we have a larger scale figuration of inner and outer space, juxtaposed in ways that allow the non-ontological, God's eye view of the planet, rendered possible by technologies uh, developed by the Cold War, to be reconfigured and localized and embodied. The juxtaposition of the satellite view of the hurricane with a bouquet of flamboyant blossoms held in the hand of a child on the right side, as seen here, highlight the multiscalar narratives of the Anthropocene, as well as the critical need to place these global technologies derived from militarism in relation to the embodied and racialized experience of the region, of the re-memory and agency of water and of watery bodies. In the words of Norbese Philip, to read the text that lies missing in the silence of the inner space, we need a new language, end quote. This language may not necessarily be human derived. In much of her recent video work uh, installations, Jack has incorporated the Rossby whistle, a sound created by the westward movement of currents from the Atlantic across the Caribbean basin and their movement back over the course of 120 days. First observed by scientists in 2016, the Caribbean is emitting a hum that can't be heard by human ears, only outer space satellites. So I want to play an example of the first of three videos where you can hear the rhythm of the waves and hear the dissonance of the augmented sound of the Rossby whistle.
to Jack, this is the sound of the violent ecological and colonial history of the region, the submarine connection between the islands, the unity of submarine as we heard earlier from Brathwaite, as well as the dissonance of the human relation to non-human nature. It is also to her ears like a heartbeat, connecting the inner space of the human and the earthly body in ways that cannot be measured, except through that telescoping to a planetary outer space. To quote from her water poem, number five, there is a sea inside me, sprawling wide, unplumbed depths. The embrace of oceans is the love I know, new currents chilled by the melting of ice caps. There is a sea inside me, witness to countless crimes. I carry evidence in my belly, witness a flotilla of bodies, bleached, bloated, blurred, pixelated, adrift in history, still seeking remembrance. Her work reminds us to return to the epigraph that water connects the human scale to other scales of life, both unfathomable and imperceptible. That connection, as we see in this final slide of the third act of Drawn by Water, is that sinking, I remembered that the embrace of oceans is the love that I know. It is in these representational acts of rememory, of care, and of embodiment that one embraces ancient and new currents. Like the work of Campos Pons, it is an ocean being and becoming, and captures for at least one moment the way in which our bodies are continually drawn by water. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we now have some time to ask questions. If anybody in the audience would like to uh, ask anything now, I actually would like to hear more about the uh, uh, work with the Rossby whistle because I think it's such an interesting. A way to make audible to human scale, something that we cannot normally hear with our own ears. And another Caribbean artist, uh, Jamila Sabur, has actually done a project on the Rosby whistle as well, in which he, it's a video installation in which um, there's several characters placed in a sort of abstracted, animated way. It's a grid and it's also a um, animated representation of maps and landscapes mm -hmm. underwater. And she really and then there's also a sextant, somebody holding a sextant. So it is really about finding our bearings or finding our own position as humans in the, in the ocean. And this, to me, is very, very interesting, the sort of intimate scale of the sea. And then the Rossby whistle is something that we cannot perceive. So I would just love to hear more about that. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that. I, um, I'm glad you brought up that exhibit. I saw it when it came out to L.A. at the Hammer Museum. And if I remember correctly, she also has some kind of lattice work with the house that's also um, part of the imagery there. And, and for me, I think what she's doing that's quite similar to Jack is that, number one, these kind of technologies that we have, and I'll kind of back up a bit about my argument, which is that the technologies that under, help us understand what climate change are had to do with the nuclear testing in the, um, in the Pacific in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and for France up to the 80s. Um, in which case they were, um, the weapons at that point by the 1950s, they pretty much understood that it wasn't really the yield of the, the force of the weapon, it actually was the radioactive contagion that was what U.S. military and other militaries were trying to develop. And because there was such an outcry, um, especially after the Bravo detonation in 1954, there was this scramble to kind of put out all these sensors around the world in order to, re, um, to measure the radioactivity of the planet, right? And so they could understand that the Bravo test in 1954 could be measured in Antarctica, could be measured in aircraft over India, could be measured all over the world. But that also, because they were measuring radioactive carbon, it gave us the backdrop for understanding what our carbon emissions are today. Right? So when I talk about Cold War technologies and satellites and all that, it's not just the space race and the kind of idea of trying to get out all these satellites and then to militarize outer space, but also that the technologies and understanding as to what our atmosphere consists of really came from that Cold War technology. So for me, what's really fascinating is that the reliance of, un of these satellites in order to read something that actually both those artists, Sabor and, and also Jack, render something profoundly intimate. And I think it's that multi-scalar relationship to me that really fascinates um, me in the way that these artists are taking something that is 
entirely abstract and technological and comes from a history of militarism of outer space um, and then render it in something quite domestic and familiar, right? And I think there's that constant um, uh, movement back and forth. I don't have, I don't think I include it in the slide, but um, Jack's work also, here it is, she also has this, oh, there we go, thank you. Um, she also has this sense of, um, there are a number of videos that take that constant, that a juxtaposition between the kind of outer space rendering or the sound of the Rossby whistle and then place it um, in contradiction with um, a young girl who's going to the sea and she's singing an old hymn and then the kind of color contrast of the flowers that represent a kind of seasonal uh, moment in um, St. Martin history but also a moment of emancipation too so there's a kind of political history to that as well as the kind of intimacy of this young girl and her embodiment as she moves to the sea so I think that I don't know, um, I mean, representing the ocean is so complex that you need that kind of multi-scalar figuration, right? So you, in order to under, the slide that you started with, was just, which is the oceanic, it's hard to render scale, right, with just with the picture of the oceanic. But if you have a boat or a, or a figure or maybe a certain kind of sound, there's a way in which you can localize it. And so I think there's that constant tension um, in that representational move to try to bring those two scales together, right? And, and I think, you know, I, I'm... Benny Means' work on allegory has been very influential to my thinking about that, that it's, uh, it's an allegorical rep representation, but it's not, um, there's always a dissonance or a kind of gap between the two, right? And I think it's that tension that the Rossby whistle really brings in. So she replays what they hear, what, what they're recording in terms of the Rossby whistle, but she speeds it up, and if you noticed, halfway through the clip, she stops it, right, and then starts it again. So there's something, when you see the ocean, you expect a kind of certain natural rhythm, right? And she takes that and kind of makes it uncanny, and I think that's what, one of the powers of her work. Yeah, it's really powerful, the fragmentation of the images and the different yeah. scales that she brings together, yeah. which you so beautifully pointed out in your talk, and then also the fragmentation of that sound, yeah. and essentially the fragmentation of our oceanic experience in, a, in an element that we usually consider as liquid and continuous. Yeah. So yeah. in a way, the absolute impossibility to really fathom the scale of the oceans and absolutely. our own involvement with them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think both artists, I think, which is why I find them so powerful, is that they insist on a certain kind of audience participation in that, right? So whether you're seeing any of Campos Pons's work, which are, you know, enormous scale, right, and you put you at the kind of submarine level, or for Deborah Jack's work, you're participating in terms of your own expectations of what you think when you see videos of the ocean shore, right, and then the, how she fragments that part, expectation. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? While you say, oh, there, we have one, great. Thank you. I um, wasn't quite ready, but I found myself in a classroom earlier this week reconstructing the argument that you develop at the beginning of your book, Allegories of the Anthropocene, and I was struck rereading it, uh, how central rupture is in your account of why allegory is <clears throat> uh, the necessary interpretive orientation towards the plethora of narratives around which the Anthropocene comes into focus. And I really appreciated that. And, I, and today I heard you frame your talk around a similar kind of concern about allegories of the Anthropocene. But I didn't, I was trying to I was trying to read with you as you were reading these objects to note how rupture constitutes something like the particular narrative orientation of these works, a narrative orientation towards uh, the oceanic, and I couldn't quite figure it out. So I'm wondering if, I don't know if this is, this is maybe not a very fair question, but could you just help me understand how rupture constitutes the narrative texture by which something like um, the Anthropocene, which I, I understand you, you're, you're quite critical of as a concept as well as uh, appreciative of, but how it works through the ontological turn to embodiment. Because in my understanding, I'll just say one last thing, like uh, uh, in particular, my very limited un understanding of how Yamaya works through the crossing via M. Jackie Alexander's Pedagogies of Crossing um, is that it, there, that to read for Yamaya's embodied force across very, very different kind of landscapes means to think with um, oceanic connectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and right, which is so. Where's the rupture in the in the in like the tidal rhythms by which Yamaya carries like silt and blood across virtually all geographies on Earth? Do you understand what I'm asking? Like, where's the rupture? Yeah, yeah it's a really that's a really great question. I, I'm sorry, I've only had one cup of coffee, so my my brain I'm still a little jet lagged, but I'll do my best. Um, and thank you for bringing up rupture, which is absolutely essential to Benjamin's concept of allegory, and it's about that kind of um, impossibility of reading of you know understanding a metaphor or an allegory for you know for an object or for a concept right and so it's always a both and it's both a kind of connection between you know let's say the inner space and the outer space um, but there's always a sense of rupture in between them and they can be the rupture of representation but it can also be um, the rupture of uh, the experience of colonialism or any of these other historical ruptures or maybe ontological ruptures so for What's different from, I mean, what I think is so um, interesting with, um, with Jackie Alexander's work, I mean, she's trying to think through the cosmological, which I think is also something I'm trying to think through at a universal scale. And for me, my training in post-colonial studies, starting with, you know, um, Chakrabarti's work on parochializing things, right? For me, it's a little bit uncomfortable to get to that on that universal. And I, I think watching his scholarly arc going from the kind of parochialism and using a kind of Marxist reading of post-colonial subaltern histories then to scale out to the Anthropocene is also one of those interesting moves, but also a necessary one, he would argue, and I probably would argue with him the same. Um, for me, where I see the rupture visually um, is quite different from what Alexander is doing. Campos Pons' work is always about the partitioning, so I think this is something similar with both artists that I'm seeing. So if you have, um, you know, Jack's work, this idea of the kind of juxtaposition of images, right? There's always a sense that you're not quite getting the full kind of universal narrative. You're getting all kinds of different perspectives worked in. And if you remember back to um, the Kempos Pons, she always has a grid-like structure, right? And so the, the Polaroids that she does and these huge scale Polaroids, sometimes there'll be four across and then maybe another four and another four, so 12. But they're always individually framed as well as part of a larger picture. So I think that's where I see the rupture in their work, that they're trying to integrate that in. And, I, and also for the context of, of her um, untitled, the breast and bottle feeding, I find that one super powerful because it's all about, on the one hand, yes, there's a kind of cosmological call to Yamaya and she's staging her own body, right, as that part. So there's a certain kind of embodiment of herself as the ocean. But the idea of the of the breast and the the bottles and then the plastic that's hanging around the neck, to me, shows the kind of... Um, the colonial violence and the kind of colonial history of the wet nurse, right, and, all, and the way in which it's almost a challenge for her, at least in that piece and some of the other ones, to make that larger cosmological claim without thinking about the kind of colonial ruptures in the figure of Yamaya, who is a, you know, a so-called new world deity, right? So it kind of shows the way that that deity was then, or not deity really, but spirit, was kind of refashioned through the process of the history of violence. So I don't know if that happened, helps to answer. Yeah. 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 That really helps a lot. Um, the, the rupture is between the body as a thing that figures and yes. the body as a thing that is figured. Exactly, exactly. And the body in, the, in multiple scales, right? Both at the kind of the inner space body, so at the psychological level, the kind of social body, the historical body, right? And then all the other scales. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for more questions. Would it be helpful for me to walk through some of the disciplinary things that I'm doing? Because I, I think I, I'm, you're, you know, training. I think we have an interdisciplinary audience here, but I can also talk through that my training is in post-colonial studies, particularly Caribbean and then indigenous Pacific studies. But then through the process of turning to histories of the environment, which are so important for understanding the history of empire, um, then about, I don't know, 15 years ago, there was a group of interdisciplinary um, thinkers who were trying to pull together these histories of the environment and placing them in conversation with art and literature. And so then you have this field called the Environment to Humanities that was, you know, uh, came out especially from a group of scholars like Deborah Birdrose and Tom Van Doren um, in um, Australia. Then they founded that journal, and then through that kind of conversation there, 
there's another group of uh, scholars, Phil Steinberg and a group of others who are cultural geographers, who are thinking about the oceanic. And so then out of that came what some of us are calling critical ocean studies, but also oceanic humanities. So these are just kind of new umbrellas that we've been using in order to try to get through some of this work and bring in these conversations that range from feminist materialism, which is, you know, Neymanis' work, which I started with, and trying to think through materiality. Um, and then the other layer to it is that this, this body of work is trying to think through the materiality of water, so rather than water being an inert backdrop ac across which generally uh, male agents cross in ships, but to kind of get in and submerge, right? And so that's part of, we're trying to kind of push this in an, a, lot, a, a deeper conversation, so to speak. And these artists, of course, are at the forefront of doing that kind of work. I actually have a question about the difference between the materiality of water that you just mentioned and then, the, and then water as a medium, which uh, you mentioned in your talk. I would love if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more yeah, on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is also why um, I'm finding so much more video art quite relevant to thinking through. So I've been thinking through water as a medium of representation, particularly submarine aesthetics, right? So if we take Brathwaite's work, which you know has influenced you as well, is to think through this concept of tidalectics. I mean, his concept is that he wants to move away from you know, um, synthesis, right? Rather than coming to synthesis, he wants to have a tidalectic so we can have multiple you know, viewpoints, which I think is, is um, I'll just go back to this one. Um, so to me, this is a very tidalectic image, right? You have these kind of multiple viewpoints and, and experiences of the ocean, and they're unified and maybe our gaze, but they're not necessarily a unified narrative, right? And so I think this is something that, that um, I think is quite helpful to think through. But for the question about the medium, I think this is why um, these uh, a lot more, and this is something also, um, if you haven't seen uh, the exhibit that um, Tatiana Flores did um, called um, Un, uh, what is it, Caribbean undercurrents? Undercurrents. Undercurrents, yeah, it's fantastic. It was an amazing exhibit that traveled around the U.S., and then there's a great catalog produced by Duke. But a lot of the Caribbean artists were thinking through using GoPro and using other kinds of technologies in order to represent a kind of submarine view, and that's something that led to our co collaborating to write this um, submerged bodies piece, is that we realized that there was this shift in representations coming from the Caribbean uh, artists who were using more video work um, and photography to kind of get into a a kind of deeper uh, level of, of, of understanding ocean as matter and ocean as medium. And I think this is where these questions about sound and, and movement, right, and mobility become really important. And I think especially in the work of Deborah Jack, right, and she's bringing that in. But then she's always denaturalizing it, right? That sound of the Rossby whistle I think is so haunting and, and the ways that she wants us always to kind of be aware about our expectations of, of the medium, but also our own, um, it's, it's, um, the impossibility of his representation of representation. Thank you. All right. Some more questions over there. Um, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on what you were just saying, but also on the the thought of diffraction and also diffracted gazes and and the sky and the ocean being a diffractive medium mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, how you see that coming back maybe in these pieces or also maybe in um, a tool to think of this inner and outer space mm -hmm. and water as a current mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to communicate between inner and outer space. Right, right, right. And I love that. I love the juxtaposition of those two terms, the idea of current and currency, right? We've had this, all, all the, the kind of metaphors of the oceanic are so easily lending to liquefy or to have currency or mobility, um, fluidity, right? All of these things are about that kind of sense. But I think, um, uh, the, Stephanie, maybe you can help me. There's a, there's a Cuban artist who ex exhibited in the uh, undercurrents exhibit, um, and he does these incredible seascapes that when you see them from afar, it's a little bit like Tony Capillan's work, you see this kind of kind of an aesthetic of fluidity and flow, but then you go, when you get closer, you see that the ocean is actually made up of metal fish hooks. And so when you get closer, then there's that kind of, you know, the violence or that kind of dis, uh, that deflection or the rupture. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. I meant to look it up this morning. but um, and, and I've been thinking a lot about his work and the way in which 
um, Jack and Campos Pons are also taking that idea that our expectations of fluidity, but then taking that aspect of deflection, right? So when I think, you know, of a Bachelard writes so lovingly about still water and clear water and fresh water. He's a real, you know, um, lover of, of um, with, well, with the fact that we call it fresh water, right? The, and that fresh water he writes about is reflective, right? So you can go to your pond and see the reflection of yourself. The ocean doesn't do that, right? And so there are ways that the ocean itself kind of, it will allow you for the fluidity of metaphor, but it's never going to have that reflective, right? It's going to be deflective. It's going to disrupt, right? And I think that's also something about the power of the medium, but also the way in which these um, artists have, have employed that medium in order to bring out that kind of, um, tension, right, between the two. Thank you. Hi, how's Hi. it going? Um, thanks for the brilliant talk, also, despite your jet lag, it was really great. And I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on what you said in the beginning of the paper when you were talking about this kind of emergent field of the blue humanities that is scripting itself as new, and at the same time, Caribbean, but also Pacific Islander studies, attentive to the ocean, and the importance of returning to that kind of work and that kind of scholarship. And I mm -hmm. wondered if you could expand a bit on that, because I know you're working on that as well, and kind of turning to blue humanities and, 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 and criticizing and thinking through how that field is scripting itself as new. Yes. And I think that's maybe something that's interesting for the audience to hear as well, like this importance of turning to these different orientations and sites. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, to back up a bit, I mean, the kind of work that this grew out of um, came from the earlier book of which I had been my dissertation and became a book called uh, Roots and Roots, and it was trying to think through if we're making these claims about the oceanic or the claim that um, Neymanus makes in the beginning that all of our bodies are constituted by water and aren't we all bodies of water, is to kind of think through at the universal level but then to kind of scale down to the regional level. And for me, what I found um, really um, powerful is that the narratives that were coming out of the Caribbean were very much about middle passage history. So they weren't about this, you know, if you look at 19th century um, literature in English, you know, it's all about the kind of sea and frontier and, you know, freedom and mobility, right, versus what was coming out of the Caribbean, which is all about um, abjection and, and violence and trauma. Um, but then the way in which certain kinds of writers like um, Derek Walcott, who's, you know, such a, a figurehead for this, is thinking through... Um, you know, he asks, where are your monuments, your martyrs, right? And, and his idea of kind of turning to the ocean is a way of thinking about it as a kind of space of beginnings and the possible origins. And so um, he was trying in his, in all of his, he's been trying to think through this question about that violence of history, but also trying to show that it was a, also a possibility of new becomings, right? And, and to have that kind of balance and to take something about a, um, the violence of diasporic history and make it into something creative, right? And so he always, he has this beautiful um, Nobel Prize um, uh, talk that was printed up later called, uh, where he thinks through this idea of when you shatter a vase, it's the love that you take to p place it together that actually makes it more meaningful, right? And so for him, care and, and, um, and uh, that reassemblage, right, was always very important, but also to go back to this question about disjuncture, the, br the vase is still cracked, right? It still has those cracks, but it's the care to kind of repair it. And that work, I was trying to put that in conversation with indigenous Pacific writing, which is about the history of Polynesian voyaging to the region. So it has that tension between understanding um, yourself as an indigenous figure to the Pacific, but also with where you can trace your ancestry to a voyaging canoe, right? And so there, there's that kind of tension between having a, um, a, a purposeful, you know, voyaging, um, but also understanding the the ship itself or the voyaging canoe as a vessel of the people. So in a lot of uh, Polynesian languages, the, the concept of the vaca means vessel, right, in the way that it does in, in English. So you can have um, the vaca as can be a vessel of the people, it can be a vessel of the community, it could be a vessel of the ancestors. Um, so that becomes a really powerful way of thinking about purposeful voyaging, but also a mobility to indigeneity, right? So I think there's the, the kind of other way of thinking that through. Um, and now, I mean, if people have been following the Hokulea, so there, that was uh, a canoe that was rebuilt in the 1970s, part of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, um, which was to reintroduce non-instrument navigation to the Pacific, which had been banned by the colonizers because the colonizers wanted people who were subject to the plantation labor and not voyaging between you know, communities, as, as was the tradition for millennia. Um, and so what you see now that's been really powerful is that a regeneration of re... Um, 
uh, re-representing and participating in these voyaging cultures. And now the Hokulea is um, sailing around the world calling attention to climate change. So there's a kind of a movement between um, the history of kind of political sovereignty and then the question about sovereignty in relationship to the ecological, right? And so this idea of using that non-instrument navigation as a as purposeful um, uh, way of, of um, communicating both, both in the uh, 1970s and 80s, it was about nuclear um, radiation of the Pacific, and now it's been turning to questions about the Anthropocene and sea level rise. So for me, those are, um, I want to place those narratives in order to think through this, uh, the cultural representation, and the historical, and the ontological, and the genealogical connection to the sea as uh, in conversation with these larger scale universalizing narratives. And now what I'm trying to move into that I'm still working through are these cosmological narratives, right? And how do you then bring in that as a layer? Because that's uh, an area that, at least in literary studies, is kind of a third rail, right? You, you, it's very secular uh, field, right? And so it's trying to bring in these multiple layers and different ways of knowing, right, essentially. Thank you. All right, I think this is a good moment for us to break for lunch and then we'll meet back here in an hour at uh, 2 p.m. We'll start with the uh, video by Julien Creuset and then you'll have a chance to uh, ask Liz more questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.